in that RDF triples, though they are useful, generally understood to be useful, have been very hard to bring into the world of web pages. And Mark has been working very hard to make those two communities come together. The result of that is a piece of work called RDFA, which um, currently is processed by our own web search for rich snippets. I'd like to, Mark is here to talk about how he sees this work evolving and impacting, impacting the web to take us beyond where we are today with respect to Web 2.0. Uh, so take it away, Mark. Great. Thank you very much, Raman. Um, hi, everybody. Um, obviously, uh, great news um, to, to hear that, uh, well, everybody puts it however they like to put it. So all the microformats people have said, hey, Google's processing microformats. And, all of my friends are saying, hey, Google's processing RDFA. But either way, it's good news on both sides. Um, uh, lots of exciting things that can be done. So my name is Mark Burbeck, as Raman says. Um, I have a small software company called Backplane, based in London. Uh, and um, we do uh, interesting things with uh, XForms and uh, the semantic web, and particularly RDFA of late. Um, some of the things I'll, I'll show. Um, but mainly, what I'd like to talk about is um, how I see some of the uh, innovations that may be now possible um, as we uh, put, uh, in, as we embed more and more information into web pages. So, obviously, publishing on the web has uh, has never been easier, um, and by that I simply mean that anybody who wants to uh, create a web page or a website, it's very straightforward. They can create a blog. Um, they can. Uh, you know, send an SMS message to Twitter from their phone, and they can get a, a web page that, that corresponds to that. Um, so it's very easy. Uh, the evolution over the over the years to, um, to to get to the point where we're at now, it's very straightforward for people to publish to the web. Um, and essentially, the the kind of foundation point that um, we'll, I'll keep coming back to as I go through is that that's the infrastructure um, that people who are interested in the semantic web and RDF um, really need to be leveraging. And that's why RDFA is exciting, is because it leverages the, uh, the kind of HTML ecosystem. Um, but anyway, so data is more difficult to publish. Um, and by that, I mean uh, if you want to um, publish information like an item for sale or something like that, you generally have to go to um, a, a centralized service and actually type in information into a specific format, into a specific form, and that centralized system has to kind of manage that information for you. So that ease of publishing a, a web page, like a blog page, isn't really there with the um, uh, publishing of, of data. But it's interesting that when you, when you look around, you do see that people are actually trying to, to do exactly that. So um, in preparing uh, these slides, I kind of just trawled around looking for different blogs and looking at different ways that people are using their blogs and came across here, for example, um, a blog, very simple, very straightforward. Somebody's uh, set it up and they've put the address of their company and their contact details. You can see, um, I don't know how clear it is actually, but um, uh, the, the text in red there um, is, is the address of the company that set this blog up. Um, and then every single post within the blog is an item for sale. Each entry, each blog entry. Um, is an item for sale, and it's got basically an image uh, of the item for sale. It's got information about the price. And so you can see that people are, are using a blog um, because it's easy to publish, but the thing that they're publishing is actually um, doesn't really lend itself very straightforwardly to a, to a kind of blog um, structure. So that's kind of one um, issue. Another issue is that um, in order to put your information into a community, to become part of a community, you tend to have to do the same as that kind of eBay scenario. You have to go to some central place in order to get your information um, into somewhere. So a, a good example would be something like Yelp, um, the review site uh, where you know, anybody who wants to do a review of a restaurant or a film or whatever um, would actually have to put the information into Yelp itself in order, in order to um, uh, get their information aligned with other people who are, who are talking about the same things. And this obviously raises questions about, well, who actually owns the data? Um, and in particular, um, again, uh, looking around at how people are, are using uh, blogs, came across a number of sites where people were blogging simply reviews. Everything that they do is reviews. So this site here is just film reviews. Every blog entry, each individual blog entry 
is a review of a film that this person's seen, old films sometimes, you know, videos or, or new films. Um, this particular site has uh, every single blog entry is uh, a book review. Um, this particular site um, uh, happens to narrow it down to book reviews about uh, books for older children. Um, so you can see that the, um, each entry there is a, is a book review. And so you can see for people like that, I mean, particularly that last example, you can't really see it very clearly in that, in that slide, but the, the person who does this, the book review site comes up about 15th um, in the Google search for, um, uh, for this particular book. So obviously for them to actually put their data into some central site, if there was a Yelp equivalent of book reviews, um, uh, for them it would be quite a big deal actually to hand over that information because obviously they're quite, uh, it's quite a popular um, uh, site. You know, they've done well to get that high in the rankings um, and to be, um, you know, because that's a general search. I just searched there for the name of the book. Um, Chanda's Secrets. So you know, obviously they're competing there with uh, Amazon and all the rest of it. And so to come on the first page, doing pretty well. So the question there of um, joining a community, of getting your information into a community, of how you align your information with other people. You can see people are using the blog format to get their kind of reviews and things out into the outside world, um, rather than going and joining the kind of Yelp style uh, central sites. Now, of course, the next step would be that, uh, that your kind of rich snippets or um, uh, uh, these kinds of uh, techniques, the Yahoo search monkey, this kind of thing, would actually um, not just enhance, as the example here, the Yelp style, or not Yelp style, the actual Yelp site, but would also um, enhance uh, uh, results from people like these small reviewers, film reviewers, uh, hobbyists maybe, or maybe they're, they're, selling, they're trying to sell books as well. Now, obviously, the format is correct, so the processing, that you're, as long as they have the correct format, um, and so this is part of the, the theme that I'm pursuing here, is that because RDFA allows them to add this information, then they essentially are able to get the same benefit that we're seeing here with um, Yelp, getting that kind of rich formatting, the rich snippet formatting, um, which we know uh, users like, uh, from what we've been told. Um, uh, so they would then uh, benefit from, from that as well. So even the small individuals would benefit from that. So that's kind of another area. So we've got the uh, people who are selling products online, each blog entry um, being a product. We've got people doing reviews. Why should they put their reviews into some central system? They want to keep them on their blog. Um, another area of interest, so I'm, I'm introducing lots of areas and, and problems, and then I'm going to try and bring, bring them together. Another area um, that I find interesting is um, publication for specialists. Um, imagine uh, if uh, Marie Curie was around today um, doing research um, uh, and chemistry and physics as she did, or inventing many things. Um, she would probably have a blog. There are many chemistry blogs out there where people actually talk about the specific research that they're doing. And so again, once again, you can see the blog format being used um, but in actually highly specialized areas where the terminology will be very precise, um, it will be something that doesn't really, um, won't be something that uh, most of the rest of us are very familiar with unless we're, um, unless we're chemists. So using uh, this blog format, um, using the, uh, um, the, the architecture of the web to convey uh, you know, very specialist information. So. We're seeing in all these examples um, blogs as um, more than uh, uh, more than just simple posts of text. You know, people sort of saying what they had for breakfast or how they feel. Um, and we can really see that people are, are starting to push the limits of what um, uh, what this kind of format is. You know, people are using it to have items that are for sale. As I've said, people are using them to um, uh, review things, um, specialist information. Um, and then uh, web pages that want to be data is an example there, which I'll come on to in a moment. So I'm not really actually saying that blogging is the future or anything. I'm not trying to say anything profound about blogging itself. Um, what I'm trying to do is use um, blogging to kind of illustrate that um, publishing a fairly basic HTML page can actually take on much more than simply being a basic HTML page. Um, and my argument is that RDFA and this idea of embedding metadata within the page itself um, is what allows us to now 
rather than these people who are pushing at the limits of HTML, it's what allows us to now take it on uh, and take them further. Um, so it's essentially saying that um, with RDFA, publishing data now becomes as easy as uh, publishing HTML. So we're essentially saying that the ecosystem, the, the many different um, uh, systems that are available to publish HTML can be leveraged to now publish data. Um, and that's not quite the same thing as kind of like a, an eBay. I mean, and hopefully this will come out and we, we may be seeing the questions and, and, and discussion. Um, but that's not quite the same thing as a, as a data-driven site. What we're saying here is that um, anybody, even a static HTML page, can, can publish data. Um, so I'd like to look then at how RDFA is helping address um, those scenarios that I've described and others. Um, but those are some of the scenarios that I, uh, that I picked up on. And by the way, if there's anything um, uh, anybody wants to kind of interject or ask any questions or make any comments, then feel free um, to do so at any time. So the first kind of category um, that I would uh, like to look at how RDFA is, is helping um, is uh, data distribution. And I've just realized that um, I haven't even inquired because of, uh, because of the way Google and what you're doing with rich snippets, I'm kind of assuming that people know what RDFA is. But that was probably uh, everybody okay with that? I mean, when I, you don't, um, okay. So, well, two things about it. Number one, I'm using it as a bit of a shorthand because I'm saying really embedded metadata. I'm saying that any way of actually putting information into the HTML page rather than the kind of traditional uh, semantic web approach, which would have been to have a separate channel. And by a separate channel, I mean you might have had an RDF XML document um, or even an RSS feed, actually, you could regard as a, as a kind of semantic channel of information. But a channel of information that's kind of distinct from the web page. Whereas what we've done with RDFA and what um, the people behind microformats were, were doing, basically the same goal was to actually make the HTML page the carrier of the metadata. Um, and sometimes it's carrying metadata about other things, and sometimes it's carrying metadata about itself. So really, when I, when I say RDFA through this, I I'm, I'm generally mean those kind of solutions that allow you to embed metadata. The reason I'm favoring RDFA is because it, it's, it's very specifically, its goal was to align itself with RDF. So it's actually much more precise than microformats. But the idea is essentially the same, that you, that you embed information there. Um, as to what it is, that's its purpose, as to what it is, it's a W3C standard now. Um, it's something we've been working on for four or so years, um, which, I don't know, I guess that's quick for the W3C. Um, we've been working on it for quite a long time. Um, and it recently became a standard. Um, and it's very much about um, defining the syntax of how you embed information. It's not really about saying what the vocabularies should, should be, um, whereas microformats is much more about the vocabularies. Um, and a good example of, of, um, of that, what the flexibility that that brings is that when Google did its rich snippets, it just came out with its own vocabulary. Got a lot of stick from it, for it from the semantic web community, or some there. But the point is that you were able to just come out with your own vocabulary. Because RDFA is about the syntax um, and the structure rather than uh, the actual terms. Um, so it's very much in the spirit of the web in the sense that it allows people to define their own vocabularies or reuse existing vocabularies and, and put them uh, into their documents however they see fit. So RDFA is a standard, and its goal is embedding metadata in, in pages. Is that okay? Is that? Um, this is a, an example of a piece of work that um, I've been involved in in London. And um, the Central Office of Information in the UK, it's a government department, and they're um, are responsible for, I don't know if it's correct to say all of the websites, but they're certainly responsible for a lot of the websites and the communication messages that go out um, uh, in the UK. And one of their jobs, one of the tasks that they were given last year was to um, come up with a way of centralizing all of the job vacancies that were available across all the different websites, um, all the different government websites or government-related websites. So, for example, the Army would have their own um, job vacancies pages. Uh, the National Health Service would have their own job vacancy pages. Um, here's a, an example on the civil service website. Um, if you want to be a civil servant, here's a job available, standard kind of thing you would expect, you know, where is the job, what's the salary range, that kind of thing. 
Um, here's a job on the uh, NHS, the National Health Service. Um, again, standard stuff, location, salary range, that kind of thing. So that was one of their um, uh, tasks to centralize the job vacancy information so that, so that the public could find it, basically, across all of the sectors. And just in passing, the kind of examples that they, that they gave to me were they were saying, if you wanted to be an electrician or a plumber in Britain, you wouldn't necessarily think to go and look at the NHS website, or you wouldn't necessarily think to go and look at the Army website, for example. Um, and some of the biggest, the, the largest number of electricians in Britain, because of all the buildings and the hospitals and everything, actually work for the NHS. So what they were trying to do is make the availability of these jobs um, known to people across the board. Um, and people obviously can't go to individual sites. So that was one task. Another task that they had to address was um, what are called consultations, which I don't know if they go by the same name over here, but it's essentially where a government department asks the public for their input on a particular issue. So here's an example um, uh, on the Ministry of Justice uh, website to do with voting, prisoners' rights to vote. And what they do is they put these things up um, on the web and they uh, basically ask for feedback from people they tell people how to provide the feedback. They provide forms. They provide email addresses, um, uh, mail addresses. And then they have a date by which you need to get your feedback in. And again, these are sprinkled throughout the different websites um, across government um, in, in, uh, in Britain. So their task was to centralize both of these things, not on the same website, but to centralize both of these things and make it easier for the public to find these things. Because obviously, if you're a democracy um, and you're asking for consultation, you want people to be able to find the site so that they can give you their feedback. Of course, the problem is that each of those sites use a different technology. So um, some sites, uh, there are some departments that have a small number of job vacancies, and they just use static HTML pages um, to put their vacancies up because they hardly um, they hardly have that many uh, vacancies. Um, there are other departments that use uh, ASP.NET. There are other departments that use Java, uh, PHP, whatever. So everybody's got a different way and a different workflow and a different technology, different architecture for how they produce their websites and how they actually get the job vacancies out there. Now, the traditional way of doing it in, in the IT world would have been to say, right, we're coming in with a brand new system. Everybody must enter their job vacancies into this centralized system, uh, and then we will then publish those vacancies um, up to the web in, in this centralized website. And as you can probably imagine, you know, two years would go by, it wouldn't happen, millions of pounds would be wasted, and the project just wouldn't work because, you know, getting people to change practices, change systems all at the same time is just kind of a, a non starter. So the solution that they went for, and this is how uh, we got involved, the solution they went for was an RDFA solution. And this is the main, the theme, this is now coming back to the theme that, um, uh, that I mentioned before about leveraging the existing HTML ecosystem, the infrastructure of HTML and, and the web HTTP and HTML, really, I'm, I'm saying. Uh, when I say HTML, I mean kind of the, the architecture of the web. By leveraging um, that, um, they were able to get the job done very quickly and much more smoothly. And essentially what they did is each of those departments was asked to put RDFA into their web pages to mark up the vacancies. So those vacancies that you saw in the civil service, in the NHS, and across government, they then contained RDFA, which very explicitly and very directly told you what the salary range was, what the location was, um, uh, you know, what the job title was, what the closing date for uh, responses uh, for the consultations or for the jobs was, and all those kinds of things. So we created vocabularies um, and, and uh, all the things that were necessary to do that. And once you had each department, all each department had to do was publish the RDFA. That was it. They didn't have to change any of their workflow. They didn't have to change the way they entered the, um, the vacancies or, or change the way that they um, checked them or tagged them or whatever. That, everything stayed the same as long as right at the very end of the process, um, their scripts, their ASP.NET, whatever it was, um, output both HTML plus the RDFA. And then what we were able to do is then create a kind of uh, federated or hierarchical, whatever, well, distributed uh, kind of approach in the way that we then consumed that. So if you look at, for example, on the very right-hand side, that swim lane on the right represents essentially the um, the individual servers, so that would be like the NHS or the Army um, uh, or the um, Civil Service or the Ministry of Justice, their individual servers. Then 
in the middle, the swim lane um, with that one box in the middle that's pointing to all of those servers is essentially this centralized uh, website that they were asked to set up. That, server, that, that, that was the kind of task that they were um, given to sort of centralize the vacancies. And that, that's represented by the, the middle swim lane. And that server's just periodically pulling in uh, the vacancies and the consultations from the various um, uh, government department websites. But then what it opens up, so that's their job done. So each department's done their job. They've published RDFA. The COI have now done their job. They've created and made available to the public um, the uh, vacancies and the um, uh, consultations. But of course, because that site also publishes RDFA, the whole thing then goes, uh, you know, turtles all the way up, I guess, um, because now those green boxes represent third-party websites that come along and say, okay, we also want to use this information. So somebody can come along and say, well, we're going to have a website that's purely for nurses, and we're going to have all the vacancies that are available for nurses that we will have um, effectively, it's kind of screen scraping, really, but with very, very precise screen scraping because of the, the way it's tagged up. Um, so we're now going to pull in the nurses' vacancies, and we're going to put them on our server. Um, and they could have got those either directly from the NHS website, or they could have got them from the centralized website. And because RDFA um, is being uh, built into each of these sets of pages and each of these publication processes, then you, you're able to get this kind of very flexible um, uh, hierarchical, uh, well, not hierarchical, distributed, I think, is probably a better, um, better way. So that there is no center to this. I mean, I've laid it out. I've represented it sort of uh, right to left there. But um, at any level, you could go and pull in RDFA from another server. So the key thing is leveraging the uh, HTML um, publishing uh, architecture that already exists. And um, uh, is it Otar? How, how do you pronounce his name? When he, he did a talk at um, uh, Semtech the other day about the rich snippets, and he said that um, uh, some of the, your partners, your launch partners, like Yelp, um, were able to implement their RDFA and microformat support in about a day. Um, and that's pretty much the same kind of experience here. Um, we did have like weeks of wrangling, but when they actually came to actually doing the technology, publishing, because you've already got the HTML and HTTP infrastructure, publishing information in this way is very, very straightforward. Okay, so that's kind of the first uh, area, kind of distributed data. Another area in which RDFA, uh, from that group of uh, different scenarios that I had at the beginning, um, can help is this idea of uh, owning your own reviews. Because very much along the lines of that model, um, once you've got your uh, reviews on your blog, uh, in this case, but essentially I'm using blog as a shorthand for any HTML publishing system that's easy to use, essentially. Um, once you've got that, then um, you've got the ability to, for it to be pulled in in that uh, federated kind of uh, distributed manner into some other server. And whether that's very generic into, into Google server or Yahoo server in the sense that we're, you're crawling everything, or whether that's more specific, it's kind of a, a Yelp for books that comes along and says, right, I'm now going to pull in just reviews and I'm going to centralize them all in one place. And uh, I don't need to, to necessarily show you this, but if you haven't, um, uh, the, the, this is the kind of the text of the review that somebody's written, they've just, this is how it looks at the moment. Uh, you know, stars equals five stars, the title of the book, the author, the, um, you know, a few, uh, I've just got a few lines there, the beginning of the review. Um, and then this is how it looks when it's marked up. Obviously, there's a number of ways you could mark it up. I've shown it here with the, the Google um, vocabulary. And uh, this is, you know, the small number of changes that would need to be made um, to actually turn this general uh, review, this general kind of flow of text into, uh, into something that's um, you know, machine readable that could be, starts to become part of that infrastructure that I showed. So you get the possibility then of somebody having, in this case, th remember this example was the one where somebody ranks quite highly in Google search for a book. You get the possibility then of them retaining their, their site, which they're obviously going to do anyway because they've done now. Uh, they've done that so far. They retain their site, but they still now get the possibility, the potential of joining uh, some community, of joining some other kind of uh, Yelp-like uh, ecosystem, because now you've got the possibility of their information being 
uh, in two places at the same time or more. Now, there's another thing. Um, you may have uh, come across the, the linked data idea. Um, I'm sure some people have, but there may be some who haven't. Um, something that's getting a lot of attention at the moment. Uh, what with uh, the British Prime Minister appointing Tim Berners-Lee as his personal advisor on linked data. Um, the, uh, the idea, I mean, there's lots of different things that people mean by it. Um, and I think often it's just generally meant that you've got kind of databases that, that have some kind of identifiers that allow you to join with other databases. But I like to think of it um, more in, in relation to the, to the current web in the sense that as you're browsing the web, if you have a bit more information available to you about um, the information that you're viewing whilst you're browsing, then you've got the possibility then of doing other things um, with that um, and pulling in other data at the same time. Um, and we can start to enrich the user interface, for example. So um, I'll give a, a, an illustration of that um, now. So um, if we kind of think back to the uh, example of uh, somebody who's writing the book review or somebody who's written the uh, restaurant review or whatever. Um, we said that one, ex one advantage of them surfacing their information was that they would get the kind of rich snippet um, uh, scenario from, uh, from your uh, search engine. So that's kind of one benefit of the, of the markup that I showed a moment ago of kind of adding that information to your, um, to your blog post or whatever. Uh, but I'd like to show another advantage, which is uh, the possibility to um, enrich the, uh, the, the actual user interface when people actually come to your blog and actually see your post, um, the ability to, um, uh, to um, well, enhance the, uh, the experience. So this is um, a kind of sequence that I'm going to go through where essentially I've created a, a dummy blog. And what I'm going to do is put information into the blog, individual posts, but what I'm also going to do is create um, what are called lenses, which are kind of uh, mechanisms that will influence the display of information based on the, t on the type of that information. Um, so what I'm showing here, this next uh, sequence of steps, is merely kind of getting everything ready in a, in a blogger um, uh, uh, space. But obviously, it could be done with, uh, with, with any um, uh, configuration of uh, web publishing mechanisms. It's not the, I, I want to keep emphasizing, I'm not really saying that blogs are somehow something special. It's just that they've got to the point now where they're so simple to use and anybody can publish HTML. It's kind of a really uh, interesting mechanism for getting this information out. So anyway, so the first step here, I'm simply modifying the template. I don't know if you can see, but. Um, So that's kind of step one, add the namespace. It means now I don't have to add it every time in, in any post that I make. Because if I'm a prolific reviewer, I'm going to be writing lots of reviews of books and things. Then uh, it just cuts down a little bit on, on what I'm going to need to add. Um, so what I've now got is, a, is a, a blog post. But this blog post is RDFA that describes how to display some information in the blog. And basically, the top chunk is a kind of selection mechanism. And the selection mechanism just simply says, go through um, the, this page and find uh, anything of type review, or rather anything of type Google vocabulary review. So it's very specific. It's looking for review items. That's the first kind of cluster of four lines that you can see as a gray haze there. Um, and then underneath, it says, um, this is what we're going to do with it. And in this particular case, it's just going to display a message that says, I found a review. Um, and it's going to say how many uh, uh, marks out of five it found. Then the next step that we do is we add um, a few uh, instructions to the, um, the blog layout. Um, and again, you know, this will all be stuff that you're familiar with, obviously, because uh, you wrote it. Um, these blocks there are just saying things like, when, when you load this um, web page, when, when this blog is written out um, to the web, uh, in the same way that you're able to add gadgets and all this kind of thing in the, in the, in the normal use of um, Blogger, what I've done here is I've just added some extra little bits of RDFA. So I'm putting in little pieces of RDFA into little snippets. Well, I shouldn't use the word snippets because that's going to be confusing. Uh, into little uh, blocks um, in the page. And that, those bits of RDFA will get picked up. 
and be seen as instructions to load these lenses, these, these, uh, these things that will kind of influence the display. So we've done kind of three things. We've added the namespace. Um, we've added a, a lens, a way of displaying it, which is RDFA. We've added the instruction to the template to load the lens. And all that shows is just what they look like. Again, it's difficult to see, but it's just a couple of lines of HTML with RDFA attributes. The final step is that I create a blog post that contains two things. It contains your review format, uh, which is the orange, um, uh, the orange properties there. And then it contains an identifier uh, which refers to the ISBN book number. And so what I'm trying to show here is how the user interface can be enriched by using linked data. Um, another category then is uh, related to the, um, uh, the uh, well, the Marie Curie example that I gave earlier. And this is the idea of uh, vertical search. This is another scenario. And this is something that I think, um, this is kind of the example I've, in, in the years I've been pursuing RDFA, this is actually the example that I often come back to because this for me is, um, I find quite exciting. Um, so, uh, don't know if you can see that, but if you were to search there for something like benzene um, compound, the results you're going to get back if you're a chemist are pretty useless. Um, you know, they're going to be sort of Wikipedia articles. They're going to be stuff. There's stuff there on health and safety. I mean, they're, they're great for Joe Public, you know, for me who knows nothing about chemistry, but for a chemist or, you know, somebody who's a specialist in a particular area, they're going to be pretty, uh, pretty meaningless. Now, there are actually sites. Um, where you can do a search, there are specialist sites that sort of say, okay, we're going to aggregate all of the journal articles, we're going to aggregate the blog posts. Um, I guess you would sort of want to see this. In, in your model, you'd probably want to see this as a, a, a custom search um, scenario. But of course, the problem with that is you have to actually uh, give it all of the, U, the URIs of all of the places that you want to actually um, uh, bring data in from. Um, Although, before I go on to that, the, uh, I should show that, the unfortunately, uh, even though... So the interesting thing here, if you do a search for benzene on that site, you don't get any articles. And yet, I found, uh, I found articles about it by following links on the site. So, so obviously, well, I don't need to tell you guys that search is a difficult business, but they, they don't even get it right. They're, they're trying to monitor all of these bits of information, but they actually you can't even use it in the way that you would like to use it. Obviously, it's a valiant effort, um, and they have lots of sites that they're linked to on there. But even though I know there are articles on there, um, which I can find if I navigate around and look through to the links, doing that search that I just did doesn't actually retrieve anything. So, so it's quite, it just shows that the problem is, is, is you know, quite a tricky one. So um, this is an example um, of the same technique um, I showed earlier. Where essentially, uh, this is just a screenshot though, um, uh, what's going on here is, is the, the kind of uh, combination of a number of different themes that, that I'm talking about here, where we've enriched the user. We, basically, what we've done is, um, just in this simple demo, is added RDFA that identifies chemical compounds to the web page. So that's quite important, obviously, from the point of view of search, because it means that you can now actually say this article is about this specific uh, compound, this blog post. So in a, in a vertical search scenario, you could surface that, um, even though there'll be far fewer links to that article uh, than there would be, say, to the Wikipedia article about benzene. For a specialist, for somebody who's uh, working in that area, it makes it much easier to find these kinds of blog posts. So that's number one. Added a couple of bits of markup, which I'll show in a second. Um, to indicate chemical compounds uh, and the names of them and the identifiers of them. And then this then goes through the same process that I showed earlier with the, with the books on the blog. Um, it fires a few messages that say, oh, I found some chemical compounds. Um, it says, what do I know about what to do with chemical compounds? And in this example, um, it knows that it can add a tooltip. So that uh, rather horrible looking uh, yellow block in the middle, uh, just below the rather horrible looking icon, is actually a tooltip that's been added automatically by this processing. So again, you can see the difference here between something like the go to Amazon and grab a bit of code that you can embed in your page. I mean, who's going to do that for every time they refer to a chemical compound? Um, whereas if you can just put an identifier in like this, and that's it, 
and then you get the benefit of this uh, richer user interface. You can see there the, the diagram representing the compound in the, in the tooltip. Um, when I mouse over, that's something that's much more meaningful to the chemist. And then, of course, um, we get the benefit that I was just talking about before about um, targeted search, the ability to do targeted search. So, kind of um, lots of different things I'm uh, throwing out here. And, um, but essentially, the, the, the theme, I mean, you know, there, 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 are, there are more problems that it solves than the ones listed here. So obviously the substance of what I'm uh, talking about is not here as a list of all the problems solved by RDFA. It's much more this new way of looking at um, uh, uh, what, I guess it's, it's saying, if we look at HTML pages and the, HTML and the HTTP HTML infrastructure in a slightly different way and look at it as a bringer of data, then we get all of these other benefits. Um, we get the uh, possibility of having um, more targeted search, uh, both uh, you know, specialist search, vertical uh, search. Um, we get the possibilities of organizations being able to publish uh, data uh, more easily, which was the, uh, the central office of information scenario with the vacancies and the um, uh, consultations. And obviously that's a big deal at the moment over here as well in the US about uh, making data available uh, to, to, the, to the public and to um, IT. Uh, making it easier for individuals to publish data. You know, the, uh, the, the book review, um, uh, restaurant review scenario, the items for sale scenario, and then the uh, customization of the user interface. All of these things um, are available once you start embedding uh, richer data into the, um, into the web page. And I didn't want to talk for an hour and then sort of, uh, you know, rush off. So I've actually kind of kept it to that because um, I'd be interested to hear if there's any questions. Yep. So sorry, I missed oh. the first part of your talk, but uh, I'm wondering, uh, is there stuff that you wish Google would push on for RDFA, uh, you know, beyond what we're already doing, beyond the little that we're already doing? Uh, well, I think there's, um, I would love to see the uh, two sides really one one is this sort of i have this mental model of kind of this line where you've got servers kind of over here doing all their clever stuff and then the ui and all the things that i'd like to do over on the right it's a metaphorical but anyway on the left hand side the kind of server side obviously you can make search uh, more targeted but i would imagine that's the kind of thing that you're you're going to be looking at doing or, or already doing um, anyway um, but that kind of being able to know when a specialist is searching for a chemical compound rather than Joe Public searching for the same chemical compound, that, that obviously would be fantastic to be able to have that, um, uh, that level. Because I think, I do think that, you know, in the spirit of the web, kind of as originally conceived, and obviously Google are very into this whole idea of it being a kind of research, um, a, a place where research is done and information shared, it would be fantastic to connect these people up. And when you watch them struggling, you know, I sort of, uh, chemistry is the one I've been following over the last couple of years because there are a couple of people who are trying to use RDFA in chemistry. They have been for a few years. So I keep looking and thinking, God, it would be great if you could help these people, you know, communicate and swap papers and swap research and this kind of thing. Um, so that, that side of it, I think, would be uh, a really rich area to pursue. Um, I would assume, monetary, you know, financially as well, I would assume being able to create these vertical you know, with targeted advertising and all the rest of it is a benefit. And then the other side I think would be um, really good would be if you could play back the RDFA in the search results so that I could then customize my user experience in the way that I was showing there. Um, but people could choose their own customizations. Um, I have this, uh, you know, kind of idea that it'd be possible at some point. Kind of imagine the way things like uh, browsers like Firefox have their custom style sheets, you know, at the moment. You can switch in a different style sheet. But imagine if you could take that to a much richer level and sort of when I see the results for um, the restaurant, I, I have a different interaction with it than, the, than how you might. But rather than having to go to a completely different server to get that different experience, we could all be leveraging the same server, Google, Yahoo, whatever, but actually um, uh, having a more custom experience based on our own settings or, uh, you know, 
And the RDFA, I feel, allows that because it, it, it sort of brings, up, brings the data right to the surface um, rather than hiding it on the server, which is the way, obviously, Web 2.0 works at the moment. You hide all that stuff on the server, and then you just pu punch out a bit of script that does something clever in the client. But there's nothing else you can do other than that clever thing. You know? Thank you for coming. Um, one, of the, one of the things that you mentioned when Rich Snippets came out was that we took some flack for the way that we defined a format. So I wondered if you have any suggestions for, for Google about how to be involved in the community in a way that still is, is pragmatic, but also something that it, that's going to make people really excited. Um, it's a difficult one to answer. I mean, well, because firstly, it's a community that you may never be able to please. Um, you know, so, you know, which is not to say that Google should be any more arrogant than it already is, because I'm sure you don't need any help with that, you know, but, <laughs> um, but it's going to be difficult to please, um, because there's a lot of, um, I don't want to go down this kind of idea that there's academia, because I think that's an unfair criticism that, that a lot of people make about the semantic web, you know, oh, there's these academics over there and then pragmatists over here. But obviously there are a lot of people who are very, very concerned with the, the, uh, the infrastructure and getting it right. Um, and they're going to be um, vocal, you know, when they think people don't get it right. So some of us were partying and thinking, wow, this is amazing what Google's done. And other people were saying, you know, about time to, and they've got it wrong, you know. So that's the kind of first thing. It's going to be difficult to please everyone. But also, I don't know where, you see, what we did with the COI work um, is, it was really impressive how far-sighted the people at COI were. Because the first thing we did um, the first thing they asked me to do was create a vocabulary. And I said, well, can I create the vocabulary in public? And in fact, I set up a Google Code project, um, put it all in SVN, got an issue tracking system, got a public list, blah, blah, blah. And I said, can I do it in public and just get people to, to uh, input um, ideas and things and hopefully reuse the vocabulary and try and create a community? And the reason I mention that is because I'm not sure you're not going to find a community. You're going to find communities of interest. So I've got, you know, the people involved in that are people involved in kind of government vocabularies and ontologies and that kind of thing. But there's nobody there who's, uh, you know, talking about um, uh, price vocabularies or product description vocabularies. So I think it's, um, th there isn't, you know, you say get involved with the community. I guess you could, but you'd have to find the right one. Um, and sometimes I, I, I don't think, you know, Sometimes I think it's fair enough to just sort of say, well, look, I mean, the figures you were showing the other day at Semtech um, and Peter Mika from uh, Yahoo was showing about, you know, getting this in perspective about the level of adoption of this kind of stuff is so low that actually coming up with a brand new vocabulary that works, you know, you could say, well, why not? You know, because <laughs> there's so much more to do. Why don't we just get on with it? So, you know, obviously what people are... Uh, don't want to see, though, is that somehow um, Google's got one thing and Yahoo's got another because they think they're going to kind of Microsoft Blackbird style, you know, own the space kind of thing, you know. And obviously people don't want to sense that. But if they sense that it's, it's based on a legitimate thing. So, for example, um, you made the point the other day, one of you, about um, uh, you, you went with that particular style of vocabulary so that there weren't loads of namespaces at the top of the document. Well, I think that's quite a legitimate... Um, uh, observation. I think, you know, people have to, we were talking at lunch about this, we, I think that's something that we have to address uh, in other vocabularies um, going forwards is, you know, making it as easy as possible for people to use. So I think if people sense that it's based on, uh, you know, a healthy kind of attempt to solve problems, I think it'll be okay. But, but which is not to say don't join the communities, but I think you have to find the right ones and, and you know, well, what do you plan to do with this vocabulary.org or, or what, you know, idea for, I mean, what, what's its kind of, how is it going to become a community? Uh, I think the answer is that uh, the data vocabulary.org, the main purpose is to document what we will ingest, basically. Mm. So the, the process for defining some new vocabulary um, would be separate from that. Mm -hmm. uh, and it might be, uh, you know, code.google.com would be a nice idea, except then this has even more of the Google is doing this stamp on it. So we'd actually like to find some other way to set up a community um, uh, to define a new vocabulary. And then once we've agreed on it, we can 
sort of uh, uh, assert that we're going to accept this by putting it on data vocabulary. So mm. uh, data vocabulary is really like the, it's the end point, I guess, of the process of defining the vocabularies mm. in our mm. view. So. Um, so would there, would there be any point at which you, so you asked me earlier, what would I like to see? You've just reminded me of another thing, which is just processing any, any RDFA. Because you, you're phrasing it as if you're gonna, you know, periodically yeah. accept another format. And yeah, so the, I mean, so for our main use, right, which is to show things in search results, mm -hmm. uh, the main hurdle is we have to understand what the, I mean, it's not, in a way, it's not semantics unless both parties understand it, <laughs> right? So mm -hmm. if you mark up your page in legitimate RDFA uh, with your own uh, uh, property names, let's say, uh, mm -hmm. we have no way of understanding what that means. People try to use same as and other mapping schemes, but... Um, yeah, but your assumption, there, your assumption there is that you're one of those two parties. Yeah. You see, whereas my, my model is that, you know, uh, the vendor is party one and the searcher is party two and you're just a conduit so you yes, don't have yes. to understand it I mean obviously you, yeah. you, there's a level at which you want to understand it to enhance the results but there's a whole other level at which oh, yeah, the we whole could thing could take off in a you know. yeah, yeah. so I mean one thing we could do is we could pass through uh, about tags in some way so that on the search results we'd you know, put them in the markup so that if you had plugins that detected those and looked for linked data mm. you know uh, you could see it on the search results. So we could do things like that, that where we're just a pass through. So would, would custom, so custom search wouldn't currently get things that you don't recognize? So, so the pass through isn't there at the moment or? Let's ask or him, Mr. Custom Search. So, so yeah, th th there's a distinction. Maybe you guys should come over here and I'll. And I'll <laughs> so th th there's a distinction to be made here between like an actual custom search engine. I don't know if you're familiar with the custom search engine product where you define like a search for a site or a collection of sites and regular web search. So for custom search engine, yes, we do intend to pass it through raw because right. there you typically have you know, some custom search creator who knows about the domain that they're talking about, you know, is, is serving a specific vertical you know, and wants to give their users a specific user experience and so they'll write their style sheets to style mm -hmm. things based on the semantics of that stuff for their users. And so in that case, you're absolutely right. We mm -hmm. don't have to understand it, we just have mm -hmm. to store it and pass it through for them. On regular web search, on the other hand, we have to say, okay, you know, we're responsible for serving the best stuff to the whole community of web users out there to get them to their results as fast as possible. You know, and, and what's the UI for all of these long tail domains? Mm -hmm. And we also have to worry about spam a lot more mm -hmm. in that mm -hmm. kind of context. Yeah. No, but that would be perfect. I mean, that scenario you describe of the custom search pass through would be absolutely ideal. Um, and, uh, yeah. Well, in, in fact, this exists. Um, right. We're, we're, it, for those custom search uh, engine customers who get uh, results in XML, we already pass through the, the, the RDFA or microformat data that you put in. We just have a common sort of key value dictionary format in which it comes back in your XML results. And we're working mm -hmm. to extend that to the other formats in which we serve custom search. So, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. No, we're excited about that case mm -hmm. also. Mm -hmm. That's great. I haven't got any more questions for you at the moment, but um, <laughs> no, any, anybody else? Anybody like to, anything on RDFA, you know, if you wanna? So maybe I should say something on that. Um, uh, the, w one of the scenarios that we're um, talking about is um, uh, actually being able to allow people to use uh, values unprefixed. And I think that, that would go some way to addressing your uh, issue about um, coming up with a names one namespace that you can use um, rather than sort of Fof and Dublin Core and all these different ones that could have been there. But I think the, 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 in inverted commas, semantic web community has gone a long way to solving a lot of those problems. But what they've done is they've, they've got a lot of the technology to solve those problems. But what we're now, which is great, we're now moving into a space where we're saying, okay, how can authors add this stuff? That's why I was trying to show the example where I said, okay, here's a, here's a Google blog, 
Um, I add a little, I add a gadget effectively, which just contains a bit of code. I added this, I added that, and there I've got this rich UI. So I was trying to show how we can start to move to this next phase where um, under the hood, there's all sorts of clever our same as stuff going on. And in that world, in the one I'm describing, where we're now talking about developers, JavaScript programmers, HTML authors adding this stuff, I think we are into the space where we do need to think about how many namespaces um, are being, uh, you know, put into the head of a document and that kind of thing. It's that. Yeah. Well, in fact, that's slightly the other way around, but I, th I would say you're, you're on, the, on the right track. And um, so this uh, COI project that I described that we did for the, um, the uh, government department, um, the Google Code project, we set it up. We had wiki pages for the vocabularies. And the idea is that the, the site is actually nothing to do with um, uh, government as such. The site is called Argo Hub dot googlecode.com, argo being A-R-G-O-T hyphen hub. Um, and the idea is that it collects together, as Raman says, vocabularies and uh, um, different ways of doing things, like a kind of recommended best practice, sort of saying, use this Dublin core term, use that FOF term, this kind of thing. Now, that was the first pass. We used wiki pages on Google Code to do all of that. But the second pass is that we're actually creating now much more precise documents, which are HTML documents with RDFA in, which define OWL ontologies um, uh, to, to ac express much more precisely exactly what it is that we want. So you can see the kind of whole thing eating your own dog food, I guess. Um, but the whole thing starts to become much more precise. Uh, and people can then use tools to, to generate documents from this information. But then you've also got the documentation and the, um, the actual specification are kind of in sync all the time because they're one and the same document. Um, so, okay. Well, thank you very much for coming. So sunny outside, so maybe we should go back out there. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Thanks.